title is encouraging. I want you to think a little bit about that word. Maybe think of something that has been encouraging to you in your life this past week. Maybe think of what it's like to be encouraged or to encourage somebody else. When we think of good news, that's usually something that's very encouraging to get, especially if you've had a lot of bad news prior to that. As we begin, I invite you to join me in prayer. Most kind and wonderful, loving Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for your blessing, for the gifts that you give to us. God, as we approach this message, let it be yours. Let this message be what you want. Words spoken, the words heard. Uh, certainly, God, you can change, you can do whatever is needed to make those come out exactly the way you want. And we pray for your message. In Jesus' name, amen. What comes to your mind when you hear the phrase, Day of the Lord. Now, recognize that the reading earlier probably gave you a little bit of a clue, but it's a, it's a phrase that we don't hear a whole lot. But when you think of that phrase, is it something that's encouraging to you, or is it something that you kind of shy away from? Some of the things that come to mind might be great tribulation in time events, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Is it good news or bad news? When you hear the word or the phrase, day of the Lord, and everybody may hear that a little bit different. There tends to be two ditches or two areas that people find themselves in that fall into these two ditches we can fall into when talking about the end times and Jesus' return. And right now, we're hearing a lot about that on the media because of the events that are occurring in the Middle East. So, is this good news? Is this bad news? Is it encouraging? Is it... I don't know. One ditch is a preoccupation with the details of how and when Christ returns while paying little attention to who is actually returning. Many presentations are meant to scare you more than encourage you. And we can hear that again in mainstream information, whether it's on social media or different speakers. But it's to scare you more than encourage you. Jesus' return has always meant to be encouraging. When you think about this phrase, the preoccupation with details of how and when, what's behind that? There's a desire to, I need to know. I want to know. And I ask, why? Why is there such a need to know the how and when? Scripture says only the Father knows, but yet mankind through history is still fascinated and preoccupied with trying to set that magic date. Do we view the day of the Lord as encouraging? Another ditch is to simply just avoid the topic altogether. Just don't talk about it, don't think about it, don't... It's a non-issue. The best way to avoid both ditches, stay focused on who Jesus is and what he has done for you and will do for us upon his return. Think on those things. Is that encouraging? Who Jesus is, is that an encouragement to you? What he has done in your life, is that an encouragement to you? And do you look forward to what he will do in your life as it moves forward at his return? 
Let's begin with today's text, and it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. And I will use the ESV, uh, English Standard Version, uh, in the message. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. And this is Paul writing to this church in Thessalonia. Remember, this is probably, again, part of the original first copy of anything in the New Testament that was uh, recorded and kept. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Paul's not telling them something new in that. He is reminding them of what they already knew. We are forgetful people, forgetful creatures. And a reminder of what we already know can just be the words of encouragement we need. You know, I think of, I have been in some of your homes, and your calendar is full of reminders for that month. So-and-so's birthday. So-and-so's coming over. And your calendar is a reminder that you look at and you remember events. Post-it notes are stuck on refrigerator doors to help you remember something. Today with phones, there's a reminder app that you can put in and it will pop up on the time that you have set to help you remember. Is it something new? No, it's reminding you. Paul reminds them that Jesus will come like a thief in the night. He effectively is saying something that they already knew. They already knew the details of that. In the New Testament, the day of the Lord is understood to be God's judgment for the entire world. Is that encouragement or is that something that's not encouraging? God's judgment serves the purpose of healing and making us whole. The biblical understanding of judgment is righteously or rightly. So having things made right should be incredibly encouraging. But we always get hung up on that in between, what's going to be happening God will sort, will come to sort out, sift through, and set things right. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be concerned. He's there for us. He's coming for us. The picture of a thief in the night refers to Jesus' return. Paul is simply saying that Jesus' return will be unexpected. You know, if we knew we were going to be robbed, would we prepare better? Would, would we go back and double check that the doors are locked and all the windows are shut? If you have a, an alarm system, you've got it turned on. Maybe the outside lights, porch or over your garage is turned on. If you knew that this was coming and you knew when, but we don't know when, it's unexpected. But does that change how we live our lives? Paul is not saying you better get your act together because Jesus may return and catch you in your life, in the acts of your life. Think about how you live. Paul is not using some fear tactic to get the Thessalonians in line, nor is that implied to us to get our acts together. No, he's saying, you know, he will return. Jesus will return, and there is great comfort in that, even if we don't know exactly when or how, but we know he will return. Jesus coming back is not a threat for us as believers. It's not something that, that we fear or should fear. It's a promise we cling to for the encouragement and hope. Do we live our lives expecting Jesus to return? Or when Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, they thought Christ would return in their time. And every generation since has the same thing. 
You know, we hear the wars and rumors of wars. We hear of all the famine and drought. So does that mean he's coming in our lifetime? We don't know. Do we need to know to live differently? This unexpected return will not be a welcomed return for the unbeliever. Think about that. The, the ones that don't have awareness, don't believe in Jesus. Verse 3, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains comes upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. In history, and even at this time, a peace that came, that they experienced was Pax Romana, Roman peace. The occupiers of that country of that time was Rome. And that peace came by, came by a way of coercion and force. The ruling authority demanded peace, but it was on their terms. And again, we look at the events in Israel right now. There was a peace that was coercion. One ruling entity said, as long as you follow these rules, we'll get along just fine. It's peaceful. But it was oppressive. And even in this time, the Roman Peace was oppressive, and people didn't like it. So when we look at and think about this peace that is coming, it's not something that is going to be coerced. It's something we can look forward to because it will change the world. The people who have rejected Christ and the peace he brings claim that peace and security only comes by their means, that ruling entity. They advocate man-made peace and security. It comes by doing, as we say, without protest. You want peace? I'll give it to you. But you got to follow my rules. you got to follow my standards. And that could be in your neighborhood. That could be in a, a country. Certainly, the oppression of people has occurred throughout history. I think of those that were slaves in this country. And as long as they did what the master said, there was a form of peace. It's when they didn't that things got really ugly. Distrust in our ideology. No need to trust in Jesus. Just trust me. I I've got this, or this country saying, follow my rules. The evidence in the Ukraine is the same, same thing. They got tired of the heavy hand of an oppressing uh, country over them, and they went to war. Is there peace there? No. There are many voices today who are saying God does not exist. And Jesus is a myth. We can be our own God and create our own future. Who needs Jesus to return? We got this. And that is a very prevalent part of a lot of society in this world. Paul switches metaphors from a thief in the night to labor pains, used to refer to sudden destruction. This picture indicates that for those who reject Christ and don't want his way to peace, his return will also be unexpected, but also painful. Labor pains. Many in this room can speak to that from a personal standpoint. I cannot, other than observation. And observation was not comforting, I can tell you that. But labor pains come with pregnancy. But the, the answer is, it's still not when, but it's coming. All the months that go by lead up to that time of birthing a child. Do you know when that, aside from 
intervention with cesarean or something from a natural standpoint do you have a calendar that tells you when that child is coming no but you know it's going to happen you're hoping it will happen in some cases the secretary at Sweeney delivered I think about three weeks early and all's good but I remember seeing her the week before and I'm I was thinking, oh, this poor lady, I, she's, she's got three weeks left. But it all worked. Again, she didn't know, just like the rest of us, we don't know when a child is going to be born. The pain will come as everything that runs counter to God's peace in Jesus Christ will be destroyed, and there is no escaping it. There is only one true source of peace. And that is in Jesus Christ. There is no time that permanent peace will occur from any human entity. It's only through Jesus Christ. Where do you look for peace and security? Do you look and, and are grateful for the police department in your community? I am. Do I feel like they are the ones that's protecting me? I think they're the part of the entity that God is using. If you're looking for peace and security anywhere other than Jesus, it will come to a sudden end. And there are communities in this country right now that they have disbanded their police departments. So that went away from, from a human standpoint. Put your trust in Jesus. Paul now switches back to those who put their trust in Jesus. And in verse 4, But you are not in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day to surprise you like a thief. We're not to, not to be surprised. We know it's coming. It's something that we are preparing for. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of night or the darkness. Something better is coming. And I, I, I hope everyone in here is saying, yes, that something is better. And the evil in our world does not get the last word. We know Jesus is faithful and true. We can think of events throughout our life that can validate his faithfulness and truth in our lives. We know he brings his peace and security, not by coercion, but by the Father's love for us. Think of that. We are recipients of the Father's love right now in our life. We don't have to fear when the, the whole world will get to experience. We can be encouraged and have joy and hope in that event. So then, let us not sleep. In other parts of Thessalonians, sleep he's referred to as, as dead, but not here. This is effectively, do not have your head buried in the sand. This is not trying to avoid. Let us not avoid, as others do, but let us keep awake and sober. Sober could be better termed alert. If you've ever been around someone that is inebriated, drunk, they're not very alert. They're confused. They don't function well. In this case, but let us keep awake and be alert. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those that just that bury their head in the sand, those, they don't pay attention. They don't want to know. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be alert. Having put on the breastplate of faith. What does a breastplate cover? What does that protect? Your heart. Your heart is so valuable to your existence, but it's something that God has said, guard your heart, 
be protective. So this breastplate of faith and love and a helmet. What, what's a helmet cover? What's that protect? Our heads, our thinking, our minds. Put on the breastplate of faith, of love, and a helmet, the hope of salvation. Align your life with the reality of who Jesus is. Think about who Jesus is in your life. Paul is warning us against living in such a way and thinking that it doesn't matter what you do. And there's a whole lot of folks out there that what I do is my business and it's not yours. It's not anybody's business but mine. And we think, okay, I'm not that way. I'm going to pose a question. Would your life activities change if Jesus came and stayed at your house for a few days? Would your vocabulary be different? Would the TV shows that you watch change? Would your internet usage change? What about? your relationships with others. I would love for Jesus to come and stay at my house, but boy, it would rock my world. I, I have to be very honest. This, this one kind of grabbed my attention. Be sober. Be mentally alert. Not lost in a dream or stumbling around drunk. Be alert. Be aware. Paul refers to having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation as part of being sober. That's part of being alert. He is not saying that we must put these things on. He assumes that we do this daily. That there is no, you need to put these on. It's more of a reminder, daily put these on. The assumption is we're already doing that. And that's good. Being sober is the command and living out of faith, hope, and love. Given to us in Christ is how we live sober. Paul finishes with words of encouragement. Verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but obtained salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake, for asleep, we might live with him. Remember the past weeks we've talked about the dead in Christ will rise first, but those alive will rise also. So whether we are awake, whether we've been asleep, we will be with Jesus. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Again. He is talking about the fact that I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you to continue doing this. The assumption is you are already doing these things. Verse 11 talks about therefore. Therefore is referring back to those first two verses. For God is not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. That's what it is. Take those things and encourage one another in this room with other people that you interface with all week long, family members. We are not the object of God's wrath. We don't have to worry about that. That's not in our world, in our purview. Jesus is not aiming to destroy us in the end, but to bring salvation that comes with Jesus. Think about those words. To be with Jesus when he brings that salvation. Jesus is coming to deliver us from evil, including death. Jesus is coming to save us completely. Paul concludes with encourage one another 
and build one another up. Can you encourage and build one another up? Do you encourage other people? Do you increase the opportunities or respond to the opportunities to encourage other people? What's it like when you receive encouragement from others? I got a little envelope in the mail this week, and it was a cartoon. And I thought, okay. And it said where it was from on the envelope, so I knew. But it was in reference to the message from last week, and it just happened to to flow in there. And this person thought, I'm going to have some fun with this, and I want to. I want someone to know and encourage. So she sent this to me, and it was encouraging. It was not something I expected. It took me a little bit to kind of put it all together, but this person touched my heart by a simple little comic cut out in an envelope. Those little things that you can do encourage people. And you have I know each one of us have been recipients of someone's thoughtful encouragement to us. Take away from this message. We don't have to know when Christ is returning. He's coming, though. That we do know. We don't have to worry about... Is he ever going to come? Yes, he is. Will he bring a peace that we've never experienced on a world basis? Yeah, very much so. Is that encouraging to us? It is to me to know that as I watch and read of some of the heinous events that are occurring in this world right now, that time is fleeting. It is going away. The encouraging part is Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he comes back, we will be a part of what he is doing. He will usher in peace and love. And we get to be a part of that. But we can live as a part of that right now with it those around us. Be encouraging. Listen to somebody. If you think of a little thought that you want to share, do it. Don't put it off. Because unless you put a reminder on your calendar or on your alarm, you will forget to tell this person that. It's better just do it then. But all possible. Don't delay in encouraging other people. It is a blessing that God has given us. He tells us to be alert. And that's what the lesson of this particular section of scriptures is. Jesus is coming. It's going to be a surprise to many. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. And we can be encouraged to know that we're a part of that plan. You know, as we think about Jesus Christ and his future, I I know that I cannot paint this picture as clear as I'd like to, but Jesus, as God and fully man, Father knows when, but Jesus, having come to this earth, lived as a as a human, experienced everything that he did, died, resurrected, ascended to heaven, knowing what the future is when he comes and restores all things. Do you think maybe he might, the human side of him might be kind of anxious? And I, I want this to happen. And and again, I'm I'm portraying human into Jesus. But think of the joy and the excitement that he has to be feeling for what he will bring from his Father who he knows loves everyone. 
as we approach this table, this is a section of his life that he put into play for us to connect back with him. He talks about remember these. Don't forget. This is for your benefit. This is so that you know I always have loved you. And in verse 26 and 28 of Matthew, while they were eating, this is in the upper room, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. Everything changed at that moment. The disciples are sitting there in the room, reclining against their lower tables. This was not the format that they had grown up with. I have to believe that their alertness, their heightened awareness, really went up at this point. When he says, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He was very intentional in providing this meal from that point forward for all of believers, for all that trust in Jesus. If you would and join me in prayer. Father God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the joy that you continually pour into our lives is just awesome. The encouragement, the relationships you have given us, the opportunities to share those with others. And we come now to this table with the elements of the bread representing Christ's broken body and the fruit of the vine representing his shed blood. How much he loved us that he put his very life on the line for us, for us to have this relationship with him. God, I do ask that you would bless these elements, the bread, crackers, the fruit of the vine, and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice, but we thank you for the knowledge you love, and there is a time coming when we can all be together, and there will be this a world we can't even imagine of the peace that you will bring. God, I I thank you, I praise you, and, and as we partake of this meal, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.